this entitled mum is incredibly fussy when it comes to food. So when she goes to a restaurant, she berates the chef for being an idiot. When the chef cooks her meal exactly as she asks, she's in for a big surprise. Happy birthday if today's your birthday and on with the revamp show. My mother's side of the family is as crazy and baby crazed as my mother herself. I have an aunt on that side who has a seven year old daughter. I don't dislike kids. I usually have no interest in very small kids because I'm afraid I will make them cry or fall etc. As for bigger kids, I love some and don't like some. Mostly depends on their interest and personality. My little cousin falls under the category of kids I don't like. First, we have zero common interests. I have I have little cousins I can play sports with, talk about books with. This one is more about makeup, princessy stuff. Not my thing, sorry. Also, she's insufferable. She screams a lot. Whenever she doesn't get her way, she yells and stomps and throws tantrums from hell. She's rude and sometimes even mean. She bullied other kids at her school. So no, I don't like her. I don't care that she's just a kid. I don't want to sit here being insulted by a screeching dwarf. My aunt never tells her no and always tells her and us how she is the best person on the planet. Fun fact, my mother raised my brothers like that. It didn't turn out well. Now on to the story. Next February, I'm going on a trip to London. I've been once already, but it was with school and only three days. So we only saw the big stuff and didn't get to explore a lot. Now I'm going a whole week, all by myself, and I'm going to have a blast. Well, my mother and aunt decided I would take my little cousin. Here is the funny thing. I'm 20 years old. My mother and the rest of her family is a huge narcissist. And when I was younger, I had to abide by all her rules in fear of her making my life even more hellish. For example, she would organize babysitting behind my back, especially if there was something I wanted to do that day, or lots of homework to complete. She would find a friend or colleague of hers in need of a babysitter, tell them I totally agreed to it, and just dump the child on me. If I refused, I was threatened with lack of food or not driving me to school anymore. She would tell the school I was sick and I had to stay home with her, even more chores on my already never-ending mountain of chores. Nowadays, while I still live at home, she has no power anymore over him because my dad 100% has my side. He's waiting for my little bro to be 18 so he can divorce her. And the house is his. She never worked so she has no money or things to her name. However, she is pretty delusional and still thinks that if she does the stuff she used to do, I will comply like before. I already proved to her that I wouldn't, but you know how it is. Narcissists forget that things don't always go the way they want them to. So I received this lovely email from my aunt, as much of a narcissist as my mother. Hello, I hope you're doing well. Your mother and I thought it would be nice of you to take cousin with you to London. That way the two of you can bond. I booked her ferry and bus ticket and the hotel for you too. You'll have to reimburse me half of it because it's a room for two. Also, I thought this could be nice for her. Day one, settling at the hotel. Mind you, her ferry arrived in the morning. That means she planned a good half day for just settling at the hotel. Day two, London Zoo. Day 3 rest Day 4 sea life London Day 5 rest Day 6 shopping She loves dolls and I love Marks and Spencer Day 7 rest Day 8 packing up to go back home Also don't make her walk too much If she says she is tired you must go back to the hotel I'll pay for her zoo and sea life tickets And we'll give her some shopping money Be careful with what she eats too And don't let her go to bed any later than 9pm I will give you some details about what stories she likes to read before bed and her morning routine next time we meet. XO XO auntie. Of course I was pretty flabbergasted to receive such an email but decided to humor her. Boredom makes us do stupid things. Besides saying no doesn't work for these people. If you say no they want you to give reasons for this no but your reasons are never good enough and they will argue endlessly with you. So I technically said yes. Dear auntie I'm doing well. I hope you are too. As for my trip to London I already booked my ferry and bus ticket. Unfortunately the times do not match yours, but surely she can board the ferry by herself, then take the bus to London and join me at the hostel. Get her a subway ticket. Speaking of the hostel, I already booked my accommodation. It's not a hotel, but a hostel. The room is lovely though, but it has 15 beds and just as many people in them. I can't promise we'll get beds next to each other, but I'll make sure to inform her neighbor of the bedtime and morning routines. Your program sounds lovely, but I love mine. I'm sure she will love it too. It's as follows. Day 1. Settling at the hostel and discovering the area around, figuring out the subway, stuff like that. She will arrive late
later than me, so maybe I'll be out, but I guess there will be no problem checking in at the hostel, since she knows so many words in English already, according to you. Day 2. In the morning, visiting Camden Town, the punk part of the city, if you will. Seven is a bit young for a first tattoo, well, for a first permanent tattoo at least. Then in the afternoon, going to the Royal Observatory and see some planetarium shows and watch the stars. She will get to tell me all about the constellations she knows by heart, like you told me. Day 3. Attending a lecture on linguistics at UCL. You always tell us she's super smart, so she will have a blast. Finally, being among academics like her. Then visiting the area around, including Leadenhall Market and maybe St Paul's Cathedral. Day 4. Going to Victor Wynne's Museum of Curiosity and maybe petting a tarantula or something of the sort. I recall you telling me she loves animals, so I'm sure she'll be ecstatic. Day 5. What would be better for a smart little girl like her than a Shakespeare play in Shakespeare's theatre? And standing, of course. We gotta stay historically accurate. If there is no play available that day, I'll move to another day, of course. Day 6. The Natural History Museum. It's said to be really huge and free. And why stop at one museum? Her thirst for knowledge won't be satisfied with so little. Let's go for the other two big museums of London while we're at it. Day 7. Morning. I don't know, but the whole afternoon, and probably the evening too, will be spent at a pub, watching rugby games. The atmosphere will be super nice, and seven is the perfect age for your first drink. Day eight, returning from the pub. I was thinking about eating breakfast in a restaurant that's at the top of a tower and open during the night, then some more walking around and packing up to go back home. Of course, we'd walk around and visit whenever we'd get a few minutes of free time. It's not every day we go to London. I'm sure she is already getting hyped up by reading this exciting program. XOXO. Funnily enough, she wasn't thrilled by my program. She got mad at my mother, and my mother got mad at me. But like I said, she can't do anything to me. All she can do is try and organize crap like that, and hope my old fear of her will come back and make me obey. Not this time, crazy lady. I didn't tell them the actual time I'll take my ferry, just in case, but I doubt they will try to send her away with me. Children can't board without an accompanying adult. I hope the tickets my aunt bought can be refunded. No, I'm kidding. I hope they can't be. Maybe it'll teach her that not everybody will bend over for her or her daughter. Just her hotel costs more than my entire trip. Ferry, hostel, food, and activities included. Imagine doing that to some young person. Like they're 20 years old, they're excited about seeing the world, and this is the first time they're going on a trip like this. And it'll be ruined by basically being a babysitter the whole time. Even worse than that, because you're not getting paid for it. In fact, the aunt had all these things set up and said, oh I'll pay for my daughter's ticket, but the expectation was that the hero of our story still had to pay her half for everything, including the expensive hotel. I mean, at the very, very, very least, to make it an incentive for her to maybe say yes to it, you'd have to agree to cover all the costs for everything. So then at least it's basically like a free trip to London. I'm glad she didn't fall for it or feel too guilty about it. She stood her ground and basically said, yeah, that's not gonna happen. And she did it in a really entertaining way. I was a full-time cook at a restaurant at a hotel and had encountered an entitled mother at a supermarket who was determined to buy my knife set and the bag it was in for a measly $50. I declined and she complained to the management there and then complained to my actual manager. I'd forget all about her for the next few months, but when her family came by for dinner, apparently she didn't forget me, or at least the restaurant I worked at. It wasn't particularly busy, but we did have a few reserved tables later in the evening. At the time, I was just a line cook. It pays all right, decent hours, and hours are pretty flexible. The special we had then was classic steak with potatoes. When asked how she'd like the steak, the entitled mum asked for well done. Now for those who are unfamiliar with steaks, cooking it well done without some very special preparations almost always results in an overcooked, dried out steak with no flavor left in it. Well done does not taste good most of the time. Orders come in and apparently the entire table ordered the steak special. We took special care of the well done steak. When I say most of the time, a well done steak comes out dried and overcooked. This isn't necessarily true. With preparation, you can get a fairly juicy and delicious well done steak. Steaks went out with fondant potatoes, parboiled peeled potatoes cut into thick scallops, pan fried and basted in tallow and butter, then baked with beef stock and fried shaved shallots. The line prepares for the next set of orders and we're off. About five minutes later, a waitress comes back with the well done steak. The complaint that the steak was not well done enough. Cue confusion. A well done steak is a steak that has absolutely no red or pink at all. We examine the steak and it was cooked all the way through. The chef goes out to talk to the lady. He comes back looking disgruntled and tells me to cook her a new steak, but 
extra well done. Well, okay, salt, pepper, cook the crap out of that perfectly good top sirloin, plate and send out. You can guess EM did not like that. The shouting that proceeds with the following cast. EM, that lady who wants her steak, extra well done. AH, annoyed and unfortunate man who is married to the said woman. AKs, annoying kids, ranging from older teen to young adult, a brother and sister respectively. AM, annoyed manager, who has to deal with her. Chef, my old boss, bless his soul. And me, I come in much later. Come on, mom. What is this crap? This tastes horrible. Ma'am, you asked for the steak very well done. This is so dry I can't possibly eat it. Mom, you're embarrassing us. I demanded to speak to your chef. I asked him to make me a steak, but if he can't even cook one properly, you should have him fired. Ma'am, with respect, we are not responsible for steaks ordered well done. What does that mean? Enter chef, big boss, god almighty in our kitchen, lord and savior whose right hand holds a frying pan, and in the other, a big old chef's knife. It means we will cook this steak how you wish, but we are not responsible for how it will taste. A well done steak is at the best of times a tricky thing to do, but I think we delivered on that. This is is not a, but an extra well done steak is going to, frankly speaking, taste terrible. At this point, the kitchen staff have all come out to watch. A dozen other diners are watching the commotion play out, and EM sees me. She doesn't recognize me for a second, but when she does, EM turns red and starts pointing at me. You! You are responsible for this crap! First you embarrass me, and now you try to poison me with terrible food! I make confused noises. I want him fired! Still shocked and confused. Confused? Ma'am, you are causing a scene. If you can't control yourself, I will have you and your family removed from the premises. EM, that's enough. He gives EM a look and she purses her lips and shuts up. Sorry about that. Maybe steak is just not for EM. Do you have anything that will come out quick so she can eat with us? The manager proceeds to get EM something more to her tastes. In this case, a roast chicken. Show's over. Back to work. Chef pulls me aside for a moment to ask me if I know EM. I tell him I don't. EM doesn't so much make a single complaint until near the very end. When her family leaves, her husband pays the bill. She takes the tips. Joke's on her. Her husband gave the waitress a big tip when she wasn't looking. It wasn't until the manager reminds me about the bad review that I remember her. We have a good laugh about it, and then promptly forget all about her until recently, when I saw her at the park earlier this week. Nothing came of that, except I noted she has grandkids now and looks pretty mellow. Still not gonna risk it. Getting your steak cooked to your liking is a sacred thing. You don't want it too overcooked and you don't want it too undercooked. There's nothing wrong with sending your steak back if it wasn't cooked to how you liked it. If you order medium rare and it comes out well done, you have every right to ask them to fix it. If they asked $15 for the meal and you gave 15 yen, they wouldn't really be happy with that either. But as it was said in the story, it's a lot harder to make a well done steak, especially an extra well done steak, I didn't even know such a thing existed, without it drying out and tasting bland. It's almost like she had an idea of what a steak should be. Somehow juicy and tender like a medium rare, but cooked all the way through like a well done. Now I'm pretty sure the only way you can really achieve this is by slow cooking a steak. It sounds like she just had her expectations way too high and were unrealistic. I never appreciated this saying, penny wise, pound foolish, until I started working for my current company. I could start up a new subreddit for it and fill it with stories of PWPF from these guys alone. We work 8am to 5pm, Monday to Friday, some work 7 to 5 and take off early on Friday. Others work a bit later, 9 to 6. Some show up 5 to 15 minutes late and stay another 5 to 15 minutes. If there's a deadline looming, it's not uncommon to see people in the office at 6pm. 7pm, 10pm, or even later. We're all honest about our hours, not that it truly matters, as we're all salaried. We make sure we work the overall hours we're supposed to. No one relies on us to be available, but we all have our contact info available if we are needed anyway. For the most part, it works nicely. People are happy and work gets done. Most people are happy, I should say. The bosses, they're never happy. They don't like the flex hours we've grown accustomed to and want to put a stop to it. Not too long ago, a memo was sent out. Our business hours are 8am to 5pm every day. Everyone is expected to be here at 8am and leave at 5pm. No exceptions. John, who drives through the worst traffic in North America, no exaggeration, was a fan of the flex hours. Coming in an hour late and staying an hour late meant he was sitting in lighter traffic each way. Mary, who has a toddler, would be in a few minutes late because of said toddler. Daycare, dressing the kid, feeding the kid, whatever it was. Having a few extra minutes was helpful. Myself, I was good with
with the 8 to 5. Sometimes I'd be a bit late, sometimes I'd be here just on time. The 5pm mark wasn't something I aligned myself with. I'd routinely stay late to get some extra work done or to get ahead. Some nights I'd work at home too. No exceptions. They'd learn to hate those two words. We sure did, but we complied. Need to stay 5 minutes late to finish off the proposal that had a strict external deadline? Nope, 5pm. No exceptions. Wake up to bad traffic due to weather? Looks like I'll be late. I guess I'll work from home today. Or take a personal day. No exceptions. Meeting running late? Sorry. It's 5pm. No exceptions. I felt like crap one morning. Woke up a bit late. Later than I wanted to. And late enough that I would have been about 5 minutes late to the office. Was I sick? Yup. Sick enough to stay home from work? Probably not. I could have powered through it. And I wasn't contagious. But alas, I was going to be late. Called in sick. No exceptions. Client wants to visit at 7.30am? No, sorry. We're not available until 8am. No exceptions. My personal favourite was when my boss yelled at me for not responding to his email on the weekend for something urgent. Sorry, it was outside of work hours. No exceptions. What was the email about? He wanted to know if I could go to a site visit that week on Thursday at 7.30am. Why that was urgent I have no idea. And 7.30am? Sorry, outside of working hours. No exceptions. I'd like to finish this off by saying the rule had been revoked. The bosses have seen their mistake, apologised for it, and reinstated our flex hours. But I can't. Despite having productivity and morale plummet, the bosses still have this rule in effect. Penny wise and pound foolish. And we comply maliciously. We see this sort of behaviour all the time with choosing beggars. You know the type. The ones who will try and get 50 cents out of someone, but they'll spend two hours to try and do it. It sounds like these bosses thought that their employees were probably taking advantage of the flexible times. However, it seemed like each of them were just making rational decisions that best suited them economically. Fortunately, if this business fails because of it, another one that makes the right business choice with flexible hours will take its place. Let's hope the bosses either change their mind or these employees find that other business sooner rather than later. Submit your story to be read on the channel at voiceyhearstories at gmail.com and join our Voicey Veteran community at r slash voiceyhear. Don't forget to like, subscribe and hit that bell to never miss an episode. Alright Voicey Veterans, I'll see you in the next one.